All right, folks, this video is all about detrital, AKA clastic sedimentary rocks. You could use those words completely interchangeably. Oh, oh, click on there. All right, unlike the other rocks that we have talked about, right? We were worried about mineralogy when we we're talking about uh, um, igneous rocks. And when we look at metamorphic rocks, we'll kind of worry about that too. Uh, when we're talking detrital or clastic sedimentary rocks, we really are not as concerned about the mineralogy uh, as we are with sediment size, right? So clastic sedimentary rocks are based primarily on sediment size, and that's because sediments are all about energy. What gets deposited where depends on how much energy is in the fluid in that environment, either the, the wind or the water, right? So for example, a, a steep mountain stream is gonna have, you know, lots of boulders and cobbles, but very little, you know, sand and silts and clay in it, right? Whereas, a lake bed, on the other hand, right? What are you settling out in lake bed? It's very dead calm. You're settling out these clays, these very, very fine, one 256 of a millimeter particle where any little will just blow them away, right? So this is all about energy, right? And our rankings here are all about energy because it takes more energy to transport larger and larger size particles, right? So that can tell us something about the energy in these environments. So take a look at this chart here, and this is going to break down some kind of common sediments and, and then their, you know, detrital or clastic sedimentary rock name, right? Uh, gravel, anything, you know, granule, pebble, cobble, boulder, right? Kind of common sediment name, we call it gravel. As a detrital rock, we would call this a conglomerate or a breccia. And we'll look at the difference between those two, right? Anything that contains sand-sized particles, and this can range from very coarse sand all the way to very fine sand. You can think of your different grits on different sand papers, right? Those are all different sand-sized grains, but different grits are, you know, different, you know, roughnesses or textures, right? You can feel this a lot, but anything that has sand-sized grains is going to be some sort of a sand or a sand stone, right? Very small grains, silts, which are still uh, physical weathering products for, you know, these little quartz grains are getting break down to very, very tiny bits, right? And then clays, these are the altered mineral products that we get from chemical weathering, right? We're not going to deal with silt so much in this class because they're kind of hard to tell from clays. We're just going to call those together a mud, right? And we'll call those either a shale or a mudstone. You can use those words interchangeably in this class because it refers to uh, things that have the exact same grain size, this clay size, maybe some silt in it as well, right? So again, classic sedimentary rocks, detrital sedimentary rocks, all about energy. That's how we primarily classify it, right? So let's take a look at these two sedimentary rocks here. First of all, in that gravel size, we have conglomerates, right? Now, conglomerates usually show some sort of uh, a rounding of the uh, of the pebbles or the grains in there, right? They're going to be a little rounded. This is going to possibly indicate that they've been tumbled or traveled a little ways, right? They've been rolling and some of those sharp edges got knocked off as they tumble and all this, right? Uh, so this shows some distance of transport. The difference between a conglomerate and a breccia is breccia has very angular blocks. And this is actually a fault breccia here, I believe. But you can see how angular these blocks are. This shows that it probably has not gone very far at all from its originally home, right? It's probably just kind of broke off and fell in place and was, you know, relithified as, as a rock, right? So this hints something at, at distance of transport, right? As well as energy, right? I mean, it's going to take a lot of energy to move these, these large chunks of rock down a stream, right? Here are some beautiful examples of sandstone. These are both out from Utah. Here's a delicate arch in Arches National Park. And I forget which canyon this is from. It's from one of the slot canyons out there. There's beautiful cross or bedded sandstone and cross bedded sandstones. A wind has actually taken sand that is eroded off the sandstone and used it to sandblast itself, basically creating these beautiful formations, right? Uh, and as we can see in this little picture at the bottom here, there's some very fine sand, some coarser sands. This doesn't even get into kind of the, the coarsest of the sands yet, but, uh, but if anything that's in this, the sand size fraction is going to be called a sandstone of some sort, right? And then our, our mud or our, our clay size fraction, this is going to be shale or mudstone. Again, these are interchangeable. They're using that we're talking about the exact same grain size here. Classically, geologists call this kind of this very fissile, this like pages in a book look stuff here. Shale. 
Uh, and that generally accumulates in, in quiet waters like um, uh, deep ocean, lagoonal, um, or lake environments. Um, whereas mudstone is this more blocky stuff here generally. Um, and that occurs as overbank deposits as rivers flood over their banks and deposit mud out in those, you know, back swamps and all that kind of good stuff. So another, a few things we want to take a look at when we're talking about clastic sedimentary rocks, right? Not only size, and that's going to indicate energy, right? But uh, a few other features as well, right? Let's take a look at these three examples of rock here. And we'll notice that, you know, these ones here are incredibly what we call angular, right? They're pointy, they're sharp, they got little edges on them, right? This again indicates this is probably a breccia. Right. Uh, and here uh, we haven't had very much distance of transport at all. The rocks just kind of broke apart and tumbled. Right. Now, here we have partially rounded. So these have been rounded a little more. They've gone through more physical weathering, more tumbling. Right. Some of those sharp points have gotten knocked off the edges. Yeah. And those are partially rounded. That uh, goes to a little bit longer distance of transport and being a sediment a longer period of time. And then we have the very well-rounded kind, right? Now this doesn't mean it's perfectly circular, right? Or spherical. This means that the edges on it are very nice and smooth, not pointy. It's been tumbled, it's been broken, you know, all of your thing like this. This is, these have been sedimentary particles for a long time. They've traveled a long ways or been sitting on, you know, lakeshore for a long time, something like that. These, these have undergone quite a bit of, of uh, uh, weathering, right? So now let's look at these, but we're not going to look at the shape of the little bits inside there, right? We're going to look at how similar in size they are to each other. So here we see again, maybe this is a breccia, and we see this probably actually a, what we call a, a glacial till, which is all the junk that's just kicked out underneath a glacier, everything from boulders to clay. Uh, and we see this is very what we call poorly sorted because of everything from these big chunks bigger than your hand right down to fine little sands and clays. And this goes to indicate, you know, the, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, feature deposited these, these different uh, um, uh, types of, of uh, uh, sediments. So here where it's very poorly sorted, that's going to indicate, you know, variable uh, energy in that environment and probably telling you that it was kicked out from a glacier, as glacial till. Moderately well sorted, we see here, they're a lot better. Most of them are, you know, yeah, similar in size, or maybe they have some little pebbles and then kind of a bunch of sand here. This is a moderately well sorted. Tells us we're maybe in, you know, so an area that has fairly consistent, but a little bit of variability in the, uh, in the uh, uh, energy in that environment. So maybe a, a lake shore or a river or something like that. And then we have very well sorted, as you see in this beautiful sand. I'm sure if you've been to the beach lately, this looks very familiar to you, right? These are sand dune type deposits, right? Wind sorts things very, very well according to size fraction, right? So this is another thing we're looking at, what, how well sorted, not how rounded it is only, but how well sorted it is. Uh, and that's going to give us clues as to what possibly caused the deposition of that uh, particular sediment. Right. So in general, farther from the source means you're going to get rounder and you're going to get smaller. Right. As you break apart, as you roll and you tumble. Right. These bigger ones are going to become smaller. They're going to tumble around, and become more rounded. Right? It's smaller and more rounded, smaller and more rounded. Right. But it, of course, depends on the environment of deposition. Right. How steep is the slope that they're on? Right, that's going to factor in to uh, controlling with the size of the, the material that can move down. Right, the strength of the current. Right, this is you know very important. Here we see a nice, you know, steep, um, high gradient uh, uh, current uh, mountain stream here. You notice that the the particles we see in this stream are are boulders and cobbles. Right, everything else has been kind of being flushed down through the system to be you know deposited later in a lower energy environment. And then, of course, the agent of transportation is important, too, as we saw on the last slide. Is it water? Is it wind? Is it ice? Right? Ice being the poorest sorter, wind being the best sorter of those.
Now included in sedimentary rocks, we also have sedimentary structures. And these are things that uh, appear within the rocks, the beds, the layers themselves that can give us further clues as to that environment. Right? So here what we see are called cross beds. So here we see, you know, these these kind of these these bigger sets these these flat layers right kind of define one of these beds but in there we see these dipping layers and what this is showing us is direction of transport right of this material so if we take a look at the down this down here and these are probably both um, sand dune fossil sand dunes basically these uh, these big tall sets of of cross beds are usually associated with sand dunes and here's how sand dunes migrate so as the wind blows say off lake michigan right onto shore right we have the the front of the sand dune and the top of that sand dune right the wind's hitting it it's being eroded off the top but as it goes over the back side what we call the lee side of the sand dune or the slip face of the sand dune uh, it's going to encounter, you know, kind of drafting, like, you know, the, the, the air gets disturbed, it's like drafting on the back of a, a semi-truck or something, and the energy gets disturbed, and when the energy gets disturbed, right, now we cause deposition, we no longer have the energy required to move those particles, so instead of moving them, we're going to deposit them, right, so a road deposit, a road deposit, and it tends to make these little cross beds as this stuff kind of slips down the slip face, right, so here's the slip face showing us the direction uh, of motion or movement uh, of these fossil sand dunes. Other fun features that we find are fossilized ripple marks. Now we can find two different types of fossilized ripple marks. We can find these which are called asymmetrical ripples. They're kind of topped in one direction, otherwise known as current ripples. This shows uh, a current or flow in one direction. So we're talking a river, a stream, a creek, something like that. Down here, we see what are known as symmetrical ripple marks or wave ripples. These are oscillatory ripples. They show back and forth motion. So if you see wave ripples, think a beach face, right? Shallow or, or even onshore. Now imagine what kind of uh, specific uh, set of circumstances it takes to preserve these ripple marks, right? First, you have to have them formed. Right? Then you have to have them kind of you know, dry out or get covered before these ripples move any farther, right? And then that has to all get preserved, right? Same thing here, these wave ripples, maybe they become, you know, partially exposed and they, they dry out, right? And then another layer of floods that comes over top of it and uh, preserves those ripples, but it's, you know, they're not going to be preserved everywhere. But these can tell us, you know, current direction or oscillatory direction, uh, whether we're dealing with a stream or whether we're dealing with a beach environment. Mud cracks are also uh, telling. Here's some, some fossil mud cracks here. And here's some mud cracks in the wild in Death Valley right now. Right? This is due basically to, you know, this these forms. You see these kind of almost you know, hexagonal forms in here. This is due to, to cooling and contraction, uh, or not cooling and contraction, uh, contraction as they as they dry out the mud kind of pulls apart from itself and contracts into kind of like little hexagonal ish shapes uh and then you know this bakes and dries you know hard as it can be another flood comes over it fills in those cracks and that's what we see here this is the negative or you know the the, the stuff that filled in the cracks right these are the cracks them themselves and one of my favorite things ever, raindrop impressions. Can you imagine the very specific circumstances it takes to preserve these? You have to have a surface that is of the right consistency, say like a silty, muddy surface. It has to be damp, but not too wet, because otherwise you'll never preserve these ripple marks. You'd have to have a, a light enough rain where they don't destroy themselves. Uh, and then they have to bake and dry hard, and then another layer has to come and flood over them. So these are very cool uh, to see some of my favorite little features. And these ripples, if you notice, uh, the edges of these have little, they're like little impact craters. Basically, when a raindrop hits, it, it creates a little impact and actually has a ejector rim and everything on the outside. And you can still see those in these little raindrop impressions. Right. Next time, we will talk chemical sedimentary rocks, folks.